and I'm going to open up the webinar and let the attendees in. Good morning, everyone. We're just giving some time for everyone to join the session and we will get started soon. I was starting and I'm just talking away on mute. <laughs> I'll start over. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session. We are so excited as we are wrapping up QCEF today on Juneteenth. We have a very exciting session for you today, very informative. Um, and to make sure we have enough time for questions and discussion at the end, um, we're gonna get started. And so this is the Black Retired Teachers Network Project presentation. Um, we will be in conversation today exploring connections uh, that this project has to freedom schools and the history of freedom schools. And I'd like to get started today by sharing a video about Juneteenth. And this video is from Lene Vini. She is a scholar, educator, activist. Um, and I thought it might be appropriate uh, since today is Juneteenth to kind of situate ourselves in kind of the historical context of the moment. And then we will do some introductions and dive in to the conversation. So give me one moment to pull that video up for us. My apologies, I had this all right. queued up. Word on the street is, Juneteenth is now being recognized as a national holiday. I'm gonna try that again. Hey y'all, what's up? It's Friday, so I'm gonna keep it black but I'm gonna keep it brief. Word on the street is, Juneteenth is now being recognized as a national holiday. What's that? Juneteenth or June 19th, 1865 is the day the last of enslaved people throughout the South were notified that the Civil War had ended, the Union had won, and they were now free. Oh my God, that is so nice. Except what I believe we asked for is for y'all to stop killing us, <laughs> to abolish the police, to give us reparations, to teach our babies more balanced and complete history in order to help us achieve a more desegregated version of freedom. Cause we was gonna celebrate anyway. We was gonna do that cause that's just how we are. We not new to this, we true to this. So it's giving gaslight. Black Americans everywhere are bothered because one, this isn't what we asked for. Two, we really wish we could just be happy that this country is finally recognizing our past, but our present circumstances currently demand that we also have an attitude. Neon light. But this type of gaslighting is not new in American history when it comes to dealing with anyone that is not white, male, or both. Stop light. Pro-life legislation. Gaslighting. The creation of a model minority myth to facilitate the further degradation of black communities. Gaslighting. Da 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 dee da da. 
da, 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 da. Lyndon B. Johnson telling Dr. King he couldn't prioritize the Voting Rights Act because he was focused on the war on poverty. Did poverty win the war? Because gaslighting. Hell, the way U.S. history classes have been taught since forever. Gaslighting. Everybody travel with the white under the sun, under the sun. But wait, what is gaslighting? Well, gaslighting can be a couple things. One, failing to recognize a person's reality and then vilifying them for their current circumstances. Two, being the root cause of a person's distress and then criminalizing them for absolutely appropriate responses to that distress. Or three, in this case, refusing to fix a problem that greatly affects a person's reality and providing them with completely unrelated solutions and or gifts. And if I'm being honest, the way we begin the story of Juneteenth is a bit of a gaslight, if you ask me. How sway? <laughs> Class is in session. As the story goes, Abraham Lincoln freed enslaved people by signing the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's just a bunch of misinformation, hoopla, and white male savior rhetoric. See, what had happened was, the Union was really just tired of fighting the Confederacy at this point. The Confederacy was weaker, had less money, had less soldiers, had less resources. And the North was like, why are they so good at staying alive and staying mad? And the trick was the enslaved population. Having people working for them at home, keeping households and families protected, and doing menial war-related labor allowed the Confederates to focus all of their attention on the war effort. So Lincoln said, ooh, if I take slavery, they don't stand a chance. So he issued a preliminary proclamation months before the Emancipation Proclamation and basically offered them a truce. If the Confederacy were to surrender under this truce, they could keep slavery forever long they wanted to. But fortunately for us, you know why Southerners gonna ride or die for their states' rights, okay? So when the truce didn't work, he was like, all right, bet. I'm setting all the black people in your territory free. And then I'm gonna invite them to come fight with us and see how long you last after that. So it was just a war strategy, folks. Lincoln knew the newly free black people would run to Union camps, fight on their side, and help them win the war. Hmm, so black people once again having to save the day but also being used as pawns at the same time. This is America. <laughs> so what's really real is that Abraham Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He wasn't even pro-black, my boy was just pro in the war. But you know what? All in all, I'm glad Juneteenth is being recognized as a federal holiday. I mean, it's about damn time because the 4th of July has always been kind of a slap in the face. This just in. Now that Juneteenth is a national holiday, millions of middle and upper class white people will now also get a day off from work while black people who are essential workers will still have to go to work. I'm sorry, you telling me that white people are about to get a day off in celebration of our first day off? You would've took your ass to work and clock in for overtime. Hey y'all, what's up? It's Friday, so I'ma keep it black, but I'm gonna keep it brief. Word on the street is. All right, and so I thought that video was appropriate because it does a few things. Um, we have a very talented Black woman who is sharing history in a very artistic use of digital media on social media. If you notice, she has over 220,000 views. Uh, when I checked the video out yesterday, it was at about 110, so it's doubled overnight. Um, and this is a way to share information, to share oral histories um, with the masses. And I thought that was a really um, awesome kind of way to start our session as all week we've been talking about um, the history of black education um, in this country globally and thinking about how we can dream about what the future looks like for uh, for black people and for um, black students experiencing education differently. And I think she's just a tremendous example of what different looks like right and how we can make um, it culturally relevant, how we can reach different people in different ways. And she'll be on MSNBC later this morning um, as well. And so I thought that was a great way to just begin our conversation today. Now I'd like to take a moment to allow each of our panelists um, to give a brief introduction of themselves. So we'll start with Dr. Jackson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tambra Jackson, and I am the Dean in the School of Education at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, also known as IUPUI. Um, I am honored and humbled to be a part of this panel today. Um, my research uh, has focused on the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools, um, particularly in the ways in which it offers liberatory practice for Black children um, and the ways in which they develop young people um, to enact culturally responsive, relevant, sustaining um, teaching practices. Thank you. Next, we'll have Mrs. Lucy Ware. Hi, um, I'm a retired teacher from Dorf Traditional Academy and where I taught um, 
gifted and talented students as well as fifth grade, third graders. And um, when I retired, I went back and continued teaching writing to the students because I felt that that was something they really lacked. And um, I was really excited to be a part of this program. I've also worked a lot with the National Writing Project as well as with the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project. Thank you, Mrs. Ware. Next we'll have Jasmine Howard. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Jasmine Howard. I'm a second year Applied Developmental Psychology master student at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm also a Heinz Fellow and a co-facilitator for the High Impact Black Reti Retired Teachers Network. Um, in 2018, I served as a servant leader intern with the Children's Defense Fund Freedom School at the Kingsley Faison site here in Pittsburgh. So I'm well connected <laughs> in many different ways with this. So thank you again for having me. And Dr. Carter Jones. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and to share this platform with uh, beautiful educators. Um, I taught school in the Pittsburgh Public Schools for many years. I also taught in the education departments of the University of Pittsburgh and at Chatham University. And my major focus has been the, the influence of culture on reader response to literature. However, now I have branched out into the influence of culture also uh, using art to develop critical uh, thinking skills. So, and, and also I've branched out into the community, which uh, is something you know, quite, quite astounding in, in, the, in the ways that the, the entire community can enhance the education of one child and make it a wholesome experience. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much. And we also have with us um, Iman Sandifer, and he is going to be our graduate student. He'll be watching the chat and helping us to facilitate questions um, at the end of our time together. Would you like to introduce yourself? All right, and we will hear from Iman a little bit later. And lastly, I'm Cassandra Brentley. I am the Director of Special Projects at the University of Pittsburgh Center for Urban Education. I uh, manage a few projects within the center and I'm also a doctoral student um, studying urban education. I have been, it's been an amazing experience um, to be involved with the High Impact Black Retired Teachers Network that we're working to develop within the center. We had the opportunity to work with students uh, this past school year uh, virtually and providing some after school programming, which you'll learn about uh, in a little bit. And I also manage a math mentoring program called Ready to Learn. It's a research part practice partnership in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon University, where we are exploring um, how we might create a application to support tutors and mentors in their practice of uh, teaching middle school students uh, math, specifically algebra. Um, and so I am so excited for the conversation that we'll have today. And we will get started um, by first watching a little video that's going to introduce us to the historical con uh, context of um, the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools. And then we will hear from Dr. Jackson um, to kind of uh, get us started. All right. And Iman, I saw that you came off mute. Did you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I definitely did. I had a little technical difficulties. Uh, thank you so much, Cassandra. Uh, my name is Iman Sandifer. I am a doctoral student at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where I'm focusing on Black male teacher recruitment and retention in the classroom. Um, I'm so excited to be here because I'm a proud fifth generation uh, educator, um, and I learned so much from my grandmother, who was a 40-year teacher in Broward County Schools in South Florida. So um, everything that I am in education, I attribute to her. And it's such a blessing to be here with you all today. Thank you so much. So just give me one moment. I'm going to queue up the video and it's about five minutes when we're going to dive into the discussion.
Marion Wright Edelman was a young lawyer when she headed south half a century ago, determined to change the world. Were you breeding young activists? Absolutely. Um, and this when you begin to teach people about the importance of reading. And Frederick Dux has talked about the importance of literacy to anything. Once you know how to read, it's very hard to make you a slave. Um, and secondly, once you learn about your history and learn to question rather than just to accept, you create a new child. Charles Cobb, then a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, had the same thing in mind. We were going to have upwards of a thousand young people from the north, mostly white, coming to the state of Mississippi. So we were also faced with the question of what are you going to do with them? What they did in the face of threats and violence was create a network of alternative schools, sending the college-age volunteers to teach young people about the value of their own history. Yes, I want to register to vote. Yes, I want a decent school. Yes, I want to be able to get a Coke if it's a hot day and there's somebody selling Coke in a restaurant. I think it's hard for people to get their heads around that. And the Freedom Schools, in part, were designed to teach young people that they didn't have to accept it. Edelman, now president of the Children's Defense Fund, never forgot about the 40 Freedom Schools created that long, hot summer. They ultimately served about 2,500 students, including some adults. Flash forward to this year, 50 years later, where for six weeks nearly 13,000 students in 29 states and more than 100 cities have begun each day this way. Harambe, a Swahili word meaning let's pull together. Washington, D.C.'s Malcolm X Elementary is one of nearly 200 freedom schools operating this summer in low-income neighborhoods, homeless shelters, juvenile detention centers, and even college campuses. Through field trips, classroom reading, and even singing and dancing, the children are learning more about themselves and about American history. Freedom School teacher Jennifer Snodgrass says the lessons fill in gaps often left unaddressed in traditional classrooms. It's very much setting the foundation for as they get older, they'll, be, they'll have prior knowledge that they can draw from to help build those facts and their own opinions and thoughts about the civil rights movement. Ten-year-old Sidney Dunbar has recently been introduced to the stories of Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela. I learned that all the sacrifices that people had to go through just to be free. And eight-year-old Anai Holly has been learning about slavery and segregation. I actually feel upset because it doesn't actually matter about your skin color. It matters about how you are on the inside, not on the outside. For Charles Cobb, this echoes the effort he launched in Mississippi 50 years ago to address educational inequality. We used to call it sharecropper education, designed to do nothing more than to keep blacks available as sharecroppers. <laughs> but it's not all about the past. It's also about the limitations of the present. Abinbola George is the project director at the Malcolm X Freedom School. Sometimes when we do home visits, I see no furniture in the living room. Sometimes, you know, I see no door handles on the locks, you know, and it's just, it's really hard to see because you realize that if it wasn't for Freedom School, some of these children won't have breakfast or lunch. Researchers from the University of North Carolina, who studied 19 Freedom Schools in Charlotte last year, found 90% of the students had no summer learning loss in reading. For two-thirds of the students, their reading skills improved. But Edelman wants to build on that preliminary success. Fifty years later, uh, why is there still a need for freedom schools? Because we still have an inferior education system for millions of children of color, and particularly if they're poor. Um, and um, Mississippi today, 90% um, I, I, of the children cannot read a computer at grade level in fourth or eighth grade and do math at grade level in fourth or eighth grade. 
Um, the, the prisons are teeming, the youth prisons and the adult prisons are teeming with black young men um, and the average literacy level of those in those prisons is about a fifth grade. What are you going to do in this economy with a fifth grade literacy level? How were slaves first introduced in America? The Children's Defense Fund is planning to honor the legacy of those first freedom schools next summer by expanding to historically black college campuses and to one of the original sites in Mississippi. Thank you, Cassandra, for opening us up with that video. Um, I'm going to do a screen share really quick so that I can. Um, oh, I need uh, I need permission to do a screen share, so I'll let her work on that and then I'll bring up a few slides that I want to share today. Um, the basis of what I really um, want to get across before we hear from Dr. Carter Jones and uh, Mrs. Ware is the freedom schools are an example of the African American philosophy of schooling. And we've had, they are but one example, but this has been a part of who we are in our histories. Um, forever and particularly let me start from the beginning here okay there we go so freedom schools uh you heard uh mr cobb in the video charlie cobb you know say that they were thinking the snick volunteers summer of 1964 they were thinking about what kind of intervention can we bring to the people, to the community, to not just give them access to voting rights, but to give them access to their history and to who they are as Black people? And so the current iteration of, of CDF Freedom Schools, it really um, builds and stands on the shoulders of previous movement programs like the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Schools, the citizenship schools that were run um, on in South Carolina and on the sea islands um, of South Carolina by Septima Clark, um, and the Highland, Highlander Folk School, which was um, created by Miles Horton uh, in collaboration with Septima Clark. Um, and these were spaces where folks used the tool of education as a means of liberation. And scholars such as um, Teresa Perry, uh, Claude Still, Asa Hilliard, Peter Morell, uh, James Anderson, they have given us histories that help us understand that um, Black folk have always held um, the twin goals of literacy and freedom. And you know, if if people have not read James Anderson's um, book on the education of blacks uh, in the South, um, it's a phenomenal um, history of how um, this last quote that I have on the screen here, you know, white missionaries from the North were astonished and resentful to find native schools or common schools for blacks established and run exclusively by ex-slaves. Ex Many ex-slaves had established their own education collectives and associations and staffed schools with entirely black teachers. And so when enslaved folks, you know, found freedom, found uh, or at least some iteration of what was told to them to be freedom, right? The first thing they did, they established educational institutions. And so to me, you know, I, I, I believe that learning and education, it is in our blood. It is what we do. And I have a five-year-old and I say to my pre-service teachers all the time, you know, unless there is some sort of physical cognitive delay or disability, people come into the world learning, right? Learning. That's what, that's what we are programmed to do as humans. And so then what happens when children come into the doors of school 
And all of a sudden that learning is slowed, it's delayed, it's stopped, right? It's interrupted. That means it's not the children. The problem is not with the child. The problem is with the environment. And one of the things that Freedom Schools has tried to do is create an environment where Black children in particular and, ch and children of color, where they thrive and where, you know, people ask me all the time, what is Freedom Schools and why do you call it Freedom Schools? What are you trying to be free from? We're just trying to be free within ourselves. That's what we're trying to be free, right? Just free within ourselves, free to be whoever we were meant to be, free to um, tap into our, our God-given potential and explore all of that. And that's what schools should be, right? Spaces of freedom. Um, and so it, at the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools, um, these are summer literacy and civic engagement programs. They operate six to eight weeks in the summertime. Um, and they also have this intergenerational component where we ask young people to invest in their communities and serve as teachers for the summer, which is what Jasmine uh, did in Pittsburgh. Um, and we have young people who do that all across the country. And the beauty of the national training is they come to Tennessee, to Haley Farm, and they see other young people who decided to give that same service and commitment for the summer. And they realize that they are not alone, that they are connected to this larger movement, this larger educational social justice movement. And so a part of my research has looked at what is it about freedom schools? What is it about the way they engage and train um, and develop young people's capabilities of employing culturally responsive, relevant, sustaining pedagogies? How do they do that at a one week training in the summer and then additional local training at sites? How do they do what we in schools of education and colleges of education struggled to do in four years. So how is it that they do that in one week and we struggle to do that in four years? And a part of that is that from the very beginning when the interns arrive at Haley Farm, they are inducted into the notion that this is not an I movement, this is a we movement. And what you do in your service as teachers this summer has a direct impact on not just the children, but their families, their community, and the uplift and liberation of our people. And that's a different entry point into education. That's a different entry point into being a teacher than what we position um, to people who declare, who formally declare themselves as education majors in schools and colleges of education. And so uh, for the purposes of our conversation today, I just wanted to pick out a few elements that I think are relevant to the Retire Black Teachers Project um, that the Center for Urban Education is engaged with. The first is this developing of sociopolitical consciousness or critical consciousness. This is something you can't teach somebody how to love Black people, <laughs> right? They, they either love the people or they don't. And, and as Cornell West says, if you don't love the people, you can't serve the people. And so one thing that I truly believe is that Children's Defense Fund develops a process for which we, we understand that his, our, our history as a people did not start with enslavement, that we are connected to a history um, of greatness. And while we know that everyone who you know, came before the enslaved were not kings and queens on the continent, we are all kings and queens in our own right, right? And so Children's Defense Fund does a good job of giving the, the young people the history and connecting that with um, 
their purpose for the summer. And so when I think about re the Retired Black Teachers Project, I think about folks like Dr. Carter Jones and Mrs. Ware, who came into education, came into teaching, and had this wonderful career of investment in children, particularly Black children, not because somebody told them they had to, but because of their own innate responsibilities to the people and the community. Um, the other thing I think about in terms of the connection between what the CDF Freedom Schools movement is doing and the Retired Black uh, Teachers Project is this understanding of liberation and how, um, unfortunately, the way that formal school is structured our children, it's like Doc, uh, Mr. Cobb said in the building, or excuse me, in the, in the documentary there in the clip, what education was at that time in Mississippi, it was defined as a sharecropper's education, meaning that it was designed to lower the aspirations of Black children at the time so that they wouldn't want more, so they couldn't dream of more, so they couldn't aspire to more. And Unfortunately, that is exactly what we see in schools right now. And so when I think about the connection between Freedom Schools and Black Teachers Project, I see this connection of connecting the children, connecting the youth to um, their own liberation. And in Freedom Schools, the primary vehicle for which we do that is with our literature and the children's books that we use. And so um, the last point I wanted to make um, based on work that I've done is this notion of collective work and responsibility. And I thought about this when we were doing our pre-planning session and Dr. Carter Jones told this story of when she received her doctorate and how she went to work and the black teachers were proud of her. They were like, you go girl, you did that. Thank you, yes. But then the white teachers were, do I have to call you doctor now? And that goes back to this work that I've done on looking at the Freedom Schools model of collective work and responsibility. We don't view the students as other people's children. We view them as our own children. And many black teachers will refer to the students, the scholars as babies. These are my babies. They came here, the, you're, you're my babies. I'm your other mother for this year when you're in my classroom. And we share the responsibility. If somebody is struggling at Freedom Schools and Jasmine knows this, every single day at Freedom Schools, we have a daily debrief and all the servant leader interns come together. They talk about the successes of the day and the challenges. If someone is having a challenge with a young person, that's not that individual servant leader's responsibility to solve. Everybody, everybody says, okay, what can we do to support you in meeting the needs of this child? And so it's collective work and responsibility, which is a principle of Kwanzaa. And so I want to end uh, just my little brief introduction here this morning. I want to end with a story because I want to give you an example of the literature in Freedom School and how all of these things that I've said, how they come together and how they come alive in the um, books that we uh, provide and teach the children with. And so the, the story that I've chosen to share with you today is called The Undefeated. And it's by Kwame Alexander and illustrated by Kadir Nelson. And Kadir Nelson is like, he is my favorite children's book author. My son's name is Kadir. And so um, just beautiful illustrated pictures. And so I thought, well, I can't just read the story and not show some of these illustrations. So I'm gonna read to you and um, I'm gonna, I've got a few of the illustrations uh, on the screen there as well. This is for the unforgettable, the swift and sweet ones who hurdled history and opened a world of possible. This is for the ones who survived America by any means necessary. This is for, excuse me, and the ones who didn't. This is for the undeniable, the ones who scored with chains 
on one hand and faith in the other. This is for the unflappable, the sophisticated ones who box adversity and tackle vision, who shine their light for the world to see and don't stop till the break of dawn. This is for the unafraid, the audacious ones who carry the red, white, and weary blues on the battlefield to save an imperfect union. The righteous marching ones who sang, we shall not be moved because black lives matter. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unlimited, unstoppable ones, the dreamers and doers who swim across the big sea of our imagination and show us the majestic shores of the promised land. The Wilma Rudolphs, the Muhammad Ali's, the Althea Gibsons, the Jesse Owens, the Jordans, the LeBrons, the Serenas and the Cheryls, the Reese Whitley's and the undiscovered. This is for the unbelievable, the we real cool ones. This is for the unbending, the black as the night is beautiful ones. This is for the underdogs and the uncertain, the unspoken, but no longer unsettled, untitled. This is for the undefeated. This is for you, Jasmine, for you, Dr. Carter Jones, for you, Cassandra, for you, Mrs. Ware. This is for us. And so I'm gonna stop there and say that I believe that Black teachers are also a part of the undefeated. And I'll yield the floor now to my co-panelists, Dr. Carter Jones and Mrs. Blair. I gotta say, I am moved. I, I'm almost ready to cry because I can remember I still feel how deep the mission is to really educate uh, black children. So in my um, high impact retired teacher program that I kind of established, I really wanted to reach the hearts of the children, you know, and in, in a sense, uh, the, the context of literature and art was, was a vehicle. It wasn't the main point, it was to reach their hearts so that they could begin to see beyond what they were seeing every day in a classroom. And right before, uh, or as the pandemic was uh, happening and schools were shutting down and I, I was retired and um, kind of leaning back with a cup of coffee, I thought, you know what? Black and brown children are gonna take a hit. I gotta get, get back in. And this is when I actually heard about, somebody called and said, I wanna nominate you. And I just said, okay and i felt like it's time and i um you know got back in and i don't even know that i really ever left but i, I was uh, thinking about um, the the idea of a we movement that in uh what i had um kind of arranged and uh made you know as i went along that uh this broad uh spectrum of uh african-american history that I had to start somewhere. And, and I think the, the, the most uh, uh, present thing was the uh, John Lewis and he had passed away, but how he had struggled and you know, fought for voting rights and you know, just uh, as a youth alongside Dr. Martin Luther King and many others. And, and, that, and I was able then to say that how young people, it's them who will change the world. They will take up the quote unquote yoke, so to speak, and move us forward. So I kind of started with that kind of idea that I'm reaching into this, uh, these young people's hearts to kind of help them, you know, encourage them, um, kind of cuddle them in a way that would make them want to see something greater and understand that there is a past to all of this. 
and we have to bring it forward and it will help us establish a stronger foundation. Thank you, Dr. Carter Jones. Before we continue with the sharing of experiences from um, Mrs. Ware and from Jasmine, I want to just take a moment to take a step back and share with you all um, exactly what is the High Impact Retired Teachers um, Network uh, that we're working to build in um, the Center for Urban Education. And so, um, in my haste and getting us started this morning and my excitement to share that video with you, I felt to recognize um, the amazing leadership that we have in the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh and our Dean, Dr. Valerie Kinlock, um, and in the Center for Urban Education uh, in Dr. Elon Dancy, who has coordinated this conference and created spaces and programs, not just within the institution of higher education, but programs like the High Impact Black Retired Teachers Network, which is a vision that he was able to get funded so that we could do this work. And so when we initially um, went out to foundations to ask for funding to make this project happen, um, it was pre-pandemic. So we had a vision that this was going to happen in person, and then we'd have this intergenerational amazing program where um, we have these high impact Black retired teachers working with students. Um, and then the pandemic happened and everybody was scrambling. And then we got an award letter that we got, we got money to fund the program. Um, and so we had to pivot. And so at the beginning of uh, this academic year in the fall, we had to take a step back and kind of reevaluate um, how we were going to deliver this programming and engage um, with our high impact uh, Black retired teachers. So we put out a call for nominations. Um, we had a ton of amazing um, teachers nominated. We could only select five. And I went to Dr. Dancy and I said, I know we only have enough money to, for five but I really would like to invite six. Um, and we figured it out and we made it happen. We were able to invite six high impact black retired teachers to participate in this pilot year. Um, we conducted programming via Zoom. Um, so it was all virtual, all online. And we spent the fall um, getting to know one another. Um, the teachers, we had each teacher paired with um, a teaching assistant who was either Heinz Fellow or a University of Pittsburgh undergraduate student to support them in the online classroom. Um, we took some time to recruit students to learn technology. Um, many of our high impact retired teachers are amazing um, and they are well into their retirement, enjoying the fruits of their labor. Um, and so teaching via Zoom was very new for them. And so we took some time to kind of learn those skills. And it was just amazing to see and learn um, from my perspective and working with the teachers um, and just learning from them, from their experiences, from their perspectives. And I loved how candid they are in higher education. Sometimes it's, you know, you got to be careful and say the right things. And um, I love that as we're planning our programming, they're like, no, we shouldn't say it like that. That sounds political. Parents aren't gonna like it that way. Like, let's just make it plain. And I appreciate that so much from a practitioner um, standpoint. And so we spent the fall getting the programming together. The high impact teachers had the autonomy to create whatever course they want. We talked with them. We said, think about what you most enjoyed teaching when you were in the classroom, your favorite lesson and then create a whole course around that. And so they, they had the autonomy to get as creative as they'd like to select the books um, and how they were gonna deliver their after school program. And we met with students twice a week um, for about an hour and a half um, during the spring semester. And so we spent the fall kind of getting organized. We spent the spring delivering the programming and the outcomes given that we were you know, surviving a pandemic, I think were simply amazing. And so the experiences that you'll hear um, come from that time that we spent together this past year kind of piloting this program and building a foundation that we hope to continue and to scale and to get in person with students um, to continue this work of creating these spaces um, where students can really flourish. And we are very inspired by freedom schools in our planning and execution of the programming. So that's kind of the connection there. So um, Mrs. Ware and Jasmine, if you would like to share or comment um, based on what Dr. Jackson has shared with us so far. Well, I was thinking about um, why 
I got how I got started. And I remember that um, I really hated school as an elementary teacher, as an elementary student. I felt like it was done, something was done to me that didn't respect who I was. And I just couldn't wait to get out. By middle school and high school, I liked school again. I did start liking school and I realized that the content of what I was teaching, what I was learning made a difference. So when I went, when I got my master's degree, I, I, it was on um, enhancing students engagement through multicultural literature. And I found that was something that got me started thinking about how we were teaching black and brown students. And so I got involved with the National Writing Project with their urban sites. I was one of the, on the leadership team. We talked about how we're gonna debunk the deficit pedagogy that pervades education today. And then I started working with the um, work sampling and we did, a, we did a couple years of work with uh, teachers in the, uh, they were Native Americans and they were looking for ways that they could assess their students that were portfolio based and not punitive. And so that I've always been interested in working with our students and helping them to become strong learners. And I found that this program allowed me to be creative, give the children the space to be comfortable and to be able to challenge them. And I was in love the idea that I could teach them things that I loved and they began to love it too. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention was I spent about eight years being a gifted and talented teacher at Dilworth Traditional Academy. And when I first got there, there was about 15 kids. They were all white and they went off to a uh, gifted center. And the principal who was African-American wanted to bring them back and back on site. And so she started a program with, with, with uh, Jackie Dandridge and some other people where we were able to have in-house gifted programs. And we increased the African-American enrollment quite weaker dribbled it. So by the end of my tenure, we had about 120 children. And the thing that I really loved was it was cool to be smart. Because the kids wanted to be smart, they wanted to be in the program. You didn't have to have a, the gift of thing behind your name, you just had to be willing to work. And they loved the grappling with hard stuff. It made them feel good about themselves. So that's, that was important to me too, because I knew I wanted my class to be challenging. I can share a little bit about my experience. So I'm going to take a step back because Freedom School was really my entry point into working in the community and loving what I do currently. So my summer in uh, 2018 at the Kingsley Phase On um, site, I had a transformative summer. Freedom School is everything that they say it is. Um, truly, it's it's such an awakening as a young person being involved in your community and just having that connection with the youth is so powerful. Um, so that really trickled in from the following years. So my role now as a co-facilitator um, in the High Impact Retired Black Network, and then also as a Heinz Fellow, just working in, with the youth in the community is something that I'm very passionate about. So this opportunity was presented to the Heinz Fellows and I was like, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> COVID has definitely, um, made it challenging but not impossible to connect with you so any opportunity that I can have to do that I'm willing to do so one overarching theme that has been woven throughout our conference all week long has been um, this idea that literacy is a pathway to, to freedom to liberation um, and Dr. Jackson you talked about it in kind of identifying um, those twin goals of literacy and freedom. And I think about my own son who is learning to read, he's seven. And so he's like, he's a real reader now. And I've just seen the world open up to him because he reads everything. And so we were on our way to dinner and we went out to dinner with my sister and her children and um, we're walking up and he's like, oh, it's happy hour. Cause there was a sign in front of the door that was advertising the happy hour. Um, specials and just in the way that he said it, um, he didn't understand happy hour in that context, but he knows what happy means. And so he knew that it was a good thing and he got excited. And for me in that moment, I really realized like, 
he, he knows how to read. He's like reading everything and it's beyond the books, right? It's when we're out in the world and he's reading things. He can read the signs, we're in the stores. He's looking things up online and reading them and bringing them back to me. Um, and just how that's really opened up this whole new world for him. And so that idea when you restrict that from folks, um, it really allows for that kind of training them to just be sharecropper mentality um, to continue and to persist. And throughout the work of... Um, that we all did this this year, literacy played a big role. And so um, my question to the panelists um, in thinking about how important it was in your selection of what you had your scholars read um, or the ways that you wove the literacy into what you created for students. Um, and even uh, Dr. Jackson, if you could speak to more about the ways in which um, the Defense Fund Freedom, Freedom Schools um, pay close attention to which texts make it on that reading list and how vital that is to the program. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, say a little bit about that. Um, so in, in the world of Freedom Schools, um, this idea that Mrs. Edelman had really started with the Black Community Crusade for Children. And she, she, this was a subgroup that she had convened to really talk about educational issues that were pertaining specifically to Black children. And out of that group, they suggested freedom schools, like we need to bring the freedom schools back. And if you look at anyone who um, has done any kind of study in the, the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Schools, a key component of the curriculum was the study of what they termed then Negro history, but it was black history. It is, it is imperative that um, every child, regardless of race, that every child can look around their environment, their world, and see the contributions of their own people, and to also understand how they can contribute to their world. And so with the Freedom Schools curriculum, um, it's, it's centered around this larger theme of I can make a difference. And it, the program is six weeks, and each week has a sub-theme. So the first week is I can make a difference in myself. And so all of the text spotlight or, or highlight for children, how they can, as kids, as five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, year olds, all the way up till 16, 17, 18 year olds, how they can make a difference. The next theme is I can make a difference in my family. I, then week three is I can make a difference in my community. Uh, week four, I can make a difference in my country. Week five, I can make a difference in my world. And then lastly, uh, week six is I can make a difference with hope, at education, and action. And so the texts are carefully selected so that they adhere to those themes and they highlight cultural images and stories of the children. Now, Freedom Schools really started off as a solution uh, for helping Black children. But it, since then, I mean, they've been operating for over 26 years now. And since then, they have incorporated a more multicultural lens to the book list. Um, but it is just, you know, important for children to be able to see that people who look like them have made valuable contributions to the world and they have that same potential. I can share next. Um, so my role was a little bit different because I was a co-facilitator or a TA. So I supported um, Mr. Doswell this year and his uh, course was a little bit different from the other high impact black retired teachers. His course connected the Caribbean and uh, music apps and music writing apps. So we used a lot of technology this year as far as learning how to read music, play music, um, learning about the history of the Caribbean. So it definitely um, 
provided history. It, it provided engaging activities with the students. I learned a lot myself. So I was learning alongside the scholars, which was so awesome and honestly brought me back to my time in Freedom School, um, learning alongside with the scholars, reading the books or participating in the activities with the students. So it was really interesting to be a part of something much bigger than myself along with the goals and missions of Freedom School. So the High Impact Black Teachers for Net Network definitely echoes all the principles that I um, learn during my time then and applying now. So that was a little bit about my role in the class that I was in this summer or this spring rather. And I would add that Mr. Dossel's class really leaned into the oral histories tradition um, and the way of connecting the uh, the historical context to the music to make um, learning the instrument more real and connected to the real world. So it was very interdisciplinary. I'll go next. Um, and I was thinking about the, the, um, the text. I didn't have a lot of books because I basically was a social studies um, cl class and we did a lot of visual learning, um, but I did have them read poetry and, um, and I had biographies, which we read, which I shortened and wrote on, put online for them to read on screens. So they had a history of um, back before, this, before 1619, all the way up to 2000. Um, it's, and one of the things I wanted them to do is be able to process what history means. So they started with their own timelines, which we did, and we made a timeline for the class starting back before before people were before our people were brought here, so they, I took them on a Google trip to Ghana so they could see where a lot of Black people in this country came from. Took them to Amina Castle virtually. I took a, took them to Kamasi Market where they could actually see people interacting with each other. It's amazing what you can do on Google. Then we came back and we talked about how this life, how our life projection changed, and then I, we even talked about Nat Turner and slave rebellions and how people were deprived the right to read and how that, you know, they, so there was imagery that they saw as well as a story. And then there was like a, a biography that went along with it. And um, it was really uh, fascinating because we talked about culture, music, the, the, the people played at that time, what kind of art they did, what they ate, what they wore. And um, the idea was that Every, every century that we went, went through, there was things that we talked about that was related to time travel. And what would your life be like if you lived in this particular time period? And um, it was a lot of, took a lot of research on my part because I had to get adult information and break it down. We talked about primary and secondary sources and they had to do interviews with their, with their oldest family member about where the, what places were important to their family and things that um, was um, that meant something to them. So we talked about the importance of being archivists and collecting things and how things last over time. That's how we get our history and how we have to shape our own symbols because we watched this video of um, Frederick Douglass giving, it wasn't really a video, it was a recording of his speech at the unveiling of the emancipation statute of, of um, Link, Abe Lincoln and the kids ripped it apart. They knew exactly why Frederick Douglass did not like that statue. And so we talked about how we have to control our own, our own imagery and how Wilma Rudolph and people who were esteemed in, in, in the past, who were sportsmen, who were like Jesse Owens, how they fought for rights. It wasn't just about myself, Jackie Robinson, it wasn't just about myself. And then they were able to, um, meet um, Josh Gibson's great-grandson, Sean Gibson, and ask some questions about his grandfather, great-grandfather, because I wanted them to see that history is real. History is just a continuum. And you have to control your story. We, it, one of the things that was interesting, I asked them who knew who Anne Frank were, was. They all knew who Anne Frank was. And, um, but I said, that's because she wrote it down and we have to write our stories down. So basically it was not as much reading because I found the fifth and sixth graders 
did not want homework. <laughs> so we did all the work in, in, our, in our 90 minutes. They had breaks and we did something. We had games, they did some more work. But I, so that they didn't have anything to do afterwards except for the interviews and taking photos of their neighborhood. And if I could just take a, a moment to, to brag on Mrs. Ware for a moment, I had the opportunity to sit in on one of her classes and her use of technology to keep her scholars engaged um, on Zoom was amazing. When she told me she um, figured out the technology was, was a little bit of a challenge for us, right? And so she had the students um, sending her pictures and then she'd airdrop them in real time to her computer so that they would show up on the screen um and just the other the resources that she was using and i'm like you're putting practicing teachers to shame right now because this is um just really well done um in considering you know uh, when we started uh, many of um, our teachers just hadn't used that type of technology before either you know it's new or um you know their their teaching styles different in person um and i thought that you did a wonderful job of um using technology to keep the students engaged um and again it's continuing those um ideas of kind of the oral storytelling we ordered the voice recorders for all of the students and they had all the tools they needed to really bring to life um, what you were exposing them too. Thank you. Wonderful. Gee willikers. Anyway, um, I, wow, Lucy, that's tough. <laughs> that's so great. I have to copy some of that. Thank you. Um, I kind of looked at my role as a, uh, a person or uh, a person who would set a direction but it would always change based on the response of the student. That that's how I would know where to go when and, and just then learning more about the student. Uh, no, I couldn't say personally, but just from their responses and how they, uh, their perspectives on things and what they said, then, then I would know how to phrase things as well as how to um, kind of develop things. And, uh, and I, I had mentioned before that the, um, the TA was instrumental in, uh, you know, creating that um, kind of like a segue into, you know, this young man's life and the the, the, the young other uh, students, the younger ones, and I just um, I I know that I'm the teacher, but I don't always uh, feel like that the student has to see me as the teacher, that I have to be broad enough to. Um, like encompass or embrace more than just, I, I, in other words, I should understand that I, I, I should be more humble as a human being to be able to connect heart to heart with these young people. So um, that's kind of how I like proceeded. And I was uh, always thinking about how to make something that would kind of support what we just did and then move it into the next idea. And I found that, uh, you know, just kind of uh, talking uh, with the TA, talking with the students and me talking with the students and the TA, it was kind of like, a, um, I don't wanna say a triumvirate, but kind of like a, um, a melding of uh, just people being people and learning from each other. And I've always had the idea that uh, the students actually teach me. This is how I know how to proceed. So they, they show me through their own learning and their responses and uh, perspectives. But uh, I used the, um, I, first of all, I ordered so many books because I thought this is going to be really a, tre <laughs> a tremendous uh, opportunity. I had like eight books, which, <laughs> which was kind of like, well, uh, I see I'm not going to get uh, through to the second one. So we ended up doing one book, which was March by John Lewis. And it's a graphic novel. And I thought that would be a great way to pull them in because uh, they could see art and there's a text as well. And um, so we started there and then we went uh, into uh, John Lewis's life and then how that connected to the movement of uh, the civil rights movement. And, um, and then even you know, further back to his, how he was educated and then further back to how during slavery, 
uh, and I showed a little, uh, you know, clips of things of uh, Kizzy, you know, um, writing near the fireplace in the with the uh, charred piece of stick. And how her mother, uh, she she was saying, her mother was saying, "What's that you're doing?" And she said, "This is my name." And her mother slapped her. You cannot learn how to read or write. In other words, you have to remember that you're a slave, otherwise you could be killed or sold away. So that was um, kind of a, a starting, a going back, a going back further, and then coming forward again. So I always tried to create a kind of um, uh, uh, in, infinite kind of movement of a back and forth and, and moving into the future. But I really uh, was uh, connecting with um, Dr. Jackson, your, this we, idea, this we movement. I really like that because it really takes everyone to do, do their own genius to add that to the going forward. And that's, uh, you know, what I, one of the things I was trying to do as well. Um, and I just, that there were certain people who were out front, but there were a whole lot of people behind who were really, you know, uh, you know, making the day every single day doing something. And that allowed uh, you know, us to move into music and um, you know, how to bring that forward in, during the civil rights movement, especially. And I keep saying every day now, uh, say it loud. So, <laughs> sorry, so anyway, mm -hmm. I don't know why I keep doing that. It just, just keeps hanging in my head. And, um, and they were like, uh, you know, uh, say it loud. You know, why, how did James Brown get into this movement? How did Mahalia Jackson get into this movement? You know, how did the artists, you know, come through? It was everybody, actors, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, so many uh, people contributing to this to try to, um, you know, go a little bit deeper beyond, you know, just, oh, I got to do this or, you know, just uh, the, this little idea of uh, uh, a one, a one time movement. Uh, this movement has never stopped. You know, and I just feel like this, um, you know, going back and reaching and saying, you know, oh, this is what we, you know, this is part of the foundation, you know, so from here, you keep going. And, um, and it turned out like really great. And I really felt like at some points that the TA was saying, oh, I never heard of that <laughs> or something that was really exciting. And I was excited too, because it was something that um, kind of, uh, you know, made the bond stronger that, that, uh, you know, and we, we made games as well. And uh, the, the, the games were word games and uh, we only had one minute to do so many words. And one minute you think that's a long time, but it's really like a short time when you're trying to think of something. And, and, and it re reminded me that when we are giving tests, these uh, state tests and all that, you have 30 minutes to do this test. Like that would just blow my mind. You know, <laughs> all of a sudden I only have 30 minutes. You know, it takes me, you know, I need time to think. So it, 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 in, in, in many ways there are aspects of, uh, you know, what I learned as well, or what was reminded of that, um, you know, helped me continue to fashion, you know, lessons that, um, you know, I think where all of us learned that, that were in there. And it was, um, I, I tell you, it was a great experience. I mean, I really, um, you know, feel honored that I've been able to participate in this and you know, look at myself more deeply, you know, as an educator, and to think more about how to move toward the future. Sorry, I get so excited sometimes. No, that's amazing. And I feel like that's a great segue that moving into the future. And this is where I might um, specifically ask Dr. Jackson. So as we're looking to scale and expand and grow this network and grow this work, um, this year was challenging because we were in a pandemic. So um, Dr. Carter Jones talks about her eight books. They're literally in my dining room. I'm packaging them up and taking them to the post office and mailing them out to students myself um, from like my office, which turned into the conference room space, right? And so um, that was a barrier that we're hopeful won't be a barrier as we look to scale this work in the future. Um, 
as Mrs. Ware, you know, sits in the sanctuary of a church, we think about how do we um, connect with churches and community organizations who are already serving students to, to collaborate and to grow our um, ability to reach students and to work with students. Um, so just based on your own experiences and your work, um, what uh, best practices might you offer or ideas um, or any guidance as we look to scale, um, scale our work? That's a good question. Um, well, I will say my experiences um, in the Freedom School movement um, have been that we have had a lot of Freedom Schools across the country who have operated um, sporadically or for one summer and then they didn't get funded. Um, and a part of it is my observations is that it's because we try to do it by ourselves. Um, and so we're, we, we just started on Monday with our freedom schools here in Indianapolis. We, we have two operating in the city. Uh, one is sponsored by the School of Education and the Center for um, Africana Studies and Culture. And the other is sponsored by a local uh, church. And one of the things that I constantly um, think about is we should not be doing this work for ourselves. And a lot of times, why things fail is because we do try to do it by ourselves. And we, you know, when we think about um, who we have been as a people, as African people, that collectivity, that working together, that is integral to our culture. And so I just think, you know, um, reaching out and in the reaching out, I tell my students, my faculty this all the time when we're doing community engaged things. Um, we are but a resource. We are not the one with all the good ideas going into a space trying to tell people how to live their lives, how to parent, how to be. We are just a resource and a conduit to assist with whatever ideas that they have. And so I think that you know, in the reaching out, it's kind of like, you know, that that story back in the day, Stone Soup, right? Every, everybody got to bring a little something to put into the pot. And so um, if we can help people see, you know, go to a church, okay, if you don't have money to contribute to the Freedom School program, what resources do you have? Do you have parents that could help stuff packets or do afternoon activities? You know, do you have people who could come in and serve as Harambe readers for us? Um, do you have people who could just uh, join us on field trips? Like, what is it that you have? Because a lot of times you have to grow people's capacity to be of service. Because um, some, you know, I, I think sometimes we, we have these models of, serve of service where you have to do something really huge to make a difference and you really don't you really don't you just got to show up showing up is important um so i i that's the first thing that comes to mind uh cassandra is not doing it by yourself the second thing and this is related to what miss ware said telling our own story and as a matter of fact, when I did my dissertation many years ago on the Freedom Schools model, um, in, in my dissertation, I wrote about how one of the elders at Freedom School, I can't call her name right now, but she was from Mississippi. And she told me, she said, baby, you have got to write this story before somebody else does and they get it wrong. And that was my impetus, because at the time I was at Michigan State and they were well known for, you know, teacher education. And many of the folks didn't believe in my work. They didn't believe it was connected to teacher education. And they told me it would never be published. They told me all kinds of stuff. But she told me, no, you 
have been called by the ancestors to write the story and you have to do it and you have to do it before somebody else does and gets the story wrong. And so I think telling our story. So I would say, you know, y'all need to videotape uh, all the retired black teachers that are a part of this project and put their voices out there. Let them tell their own stories of, of excuse me, what they're doing in the program. And I think that's how, that's a part of that expansion and getting people to support it <clears throat> financially. Thank you. I'm over here taking like vigorous notes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, and definitely the collaborations. So we've been in, in deep conversation already about how do we collaborate? How do we bring in partners who are already doing the work to offer a resource, the high impact retired teachers. And, um, and that's, that's very powerful. And then also the storytelling. Um, I'll, I'll add one more thing about the storytelling. So our site this summer, you know, last summer we didn't operate because of the pandemic. And every year it's a struggle for us to, you know, raise the money. Um, and so this year we are funded by a community engagement grant. And a part of what we wrote in the grant is that we're going to teach the servant leaders how to be community engaged scholars. And so the servant leader interns, we are teaching them research skills. So they're learning how to collect data. They're learning how to be ethnographers. And it, the young people, I, I say all the time, this intergenerational leadership model is so important. The elders and the, those of us who have been around for a minute we have the wisdom of time. We can see what has happened over time. We can under, we can, we can relay to the young people, you know, these are some things to watch out for. But the young people have the energy. They have the energy. And so we have to yield the floor to them and let them move forward with their ideas and that sort of thing. And so we could have said, you know, we as the project directors and that sort of thing that we're going to go and we're going to collect all this data and tell the Freedom School story, but we didn't. We said we're going to teach the young people the skills so then they can tell the story. They can tell their own story. That's very powerful as well. And um, even just thinking about how powerful it is to hear youth voice. And we hear that a lot kind of as a buzzword. Um, but when you truly take the reins off, and I feel like that's one thing we were able to do in our program is it wasn't restricted by standards and we can't say this. And But when you can offer that freedom for them to really tell their story, um, you get something very authentic and something very real. And I see that we have, um, we're right at 11.17. So I think this might be in our last kind of 10 minutes or so, a good time to transition to answer any questions that are coming up in the chat. Um, I see one. Um, and Iman, would you like to introduce the questions that are, that are arising? Yes, definitely. So our first question um, is, how will you incorporate what you learned by teaching virtually in future iterations of this program when able to be in person again? And anyone can feel free to um, share their thoughts. All right, the question again is, how will you incorporate what you learn by teaching virtually and future iterations of this program when able to be in person again? I can answer for me. Um, I love to be able to work in person, get that feedback immediately right away. Somebody gets it if they didn't. Um, I think I would use a lot more uh, technology because there's some things that I didn't know were out there. They're so engaging for, for young people and they do it and they give you reports and everything and it's like this is wonderful you know you you want to even like the name picker playing that instead of just always just calling somebody raise their hand you know just let, do that randomness of it um the, the if you're studying something find something online where you have the maybe the voice of that person speaking um you know there's a lot of really in-depth 
content you can get online that that's broken down for kids. Like even the Fletzy, Fletzy versus Ferguson, I saw a really great online lesson on that, just like five minutes. And that's a really complex concept for kids to understand. And so I would just do the best things about being in person, which is immediate feedback, the touch on the shoulder, encouragement, the bonding activities. But then I'd go do a lot more technology because I like it. <laughs> Dr. Carter Jones, did you want to go and share? Oh. I'll share after. You go ahead. Okay. Um, so I would add to that as well. Um, being in person definitely helps with relationship building much quicker than virtually. It's, it's very hard um, to build trust over any type of technology, let alone in person. So in-person interaction definitely will help. Um, moving forward as this program moves to like an in-person model, but also keeping for like keeping at the center of everything that we do as the collaborative piece of working with the youth, of working with the TA, working with the teacher, because that definitely um, made the experience so much better and worthwhile when it, what, it just wasn't one person deciding, you know, let's do it this way and then everybody else follows. No, like even with my role, like I had so much voice I feel like even just working with my retired teacher letting him know like hey like I'm in virtual classrooms currently this is what works as, as I'm seeing it firsthand and this is what doesn't work so let's try to um, make it more entertaining and engaging for students so they engage with us um, so keeping that collaboration piece at the forefront um, moving this to a hybrid model in person virtually whatever the future iteration of that is I was thinking just that a hybrid model. <laughs> Thank you, um, and and that's uh, you know in, I love in person. I love um, I love just seeing what they wear, how they move their bodies, you know how they say what they uh, you know say. Uh, I, I really can get into the rhythm of uh, a, a student's life kind of uh, much better in person, and I struggled to get in a, a rhythm. Uh, virtually, but I, I think we did hit it though, you know, as we kept moving, we, I think we finally said, even though I only uh, saw mostly the tops of heads, but I thought that was a good start, actually, <laughs> that, that it, it, uh, you got to start somewhere. And um, the, the, the virtual kind of um, idea is that there's a lot of space out there. There's a lot of uh, a lot of everything out there and that it can be tapped through the uh, technology. So I, I, I'm thinking more of, um, you know, even that if the class is uh, a, a certain time, uh, what we did from uh, four to 5.30, that it could, if somebody says, I can't make it from four to, to five, I can only come get on on five, that that would be an opportunity to, um, you know, and, and it, have to, it would have to be worked out and the, the, the facilitator would have to be willing to say, okay, let's zoom in at a different time that's, you know, reasonable for you. So that no student is uh, like left out of an opportunity to gain something. Thank you all. I might just add, um, a definitely a hybrid model is something we're considering because one of the benefits of being online is we were able to reach students outside of the region. And we had a really diverse mix of students from public school, private school, charter school, from the suburbs, from in the city, from even rural areas. And they were able to all engage and participate. Um, and then, like you said, Dr. Carter Jones, just being able to quickly be flexible um, in terms of timing um, and in terms of space. I uh, sat in on one of the courses and there was a student once they started going back to school in person, um, she's in the car, but she's engaged and paying attention on her mom's phone because she's able to um, be in transition, but since it's online, still engage and participate. And so thinking about um, some of the benefits we see with technology and how we might kind of fuse both in person and online um, to create um, opportunities to make it more accessible for students. And I wanted to add that um, 
the teaching assistant was great to have somebody who was young, who knew technology and who was like watching things. It was like two eyes all, at all times. And we collaborated together before lessons. And then after we talked about the lessons. And so she said she was learning too, because some of the things we were teaching, she's a, her culture is a little bit different. And she said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So it was kind of cool. So definitely a learning experience for everybody. Any other questions coming in from the chat? We don't have any additional questions, but I definitely have a question. Um, I would love to know about um, work-life balance. As a, as, a, as a grandson of a 40-year teacher, um, I got the chance to see the at home of my great educator. Um, but I'm, I'm just so curious as to how you um, were able to balance what you know is happening in the community. And you're of course a teacher and trying to educate, but also the, the bird, there's a burden there. So how are you able to balance that? Or how were you able to balance that? It's my question. Can you rephrase that? Yeah, so the work-life balance of just knowing the deep work that you're doing within the Freedom School, within the community, but also how are you able to, I guess, um, find a balance between, of course, what you know is happening in the community and what you're trying to impress upon the children, but you know, you come home and you have a whole life at home that is outside of the school. So how are you able to balance that? Um, during that time, or just in general? I think for me, um, I think the balance was that I never lost sight of uh, like students' uh, situations, that they weren't quite different from <laughs> basically any other thing that, uh, you know, we as a people have experienced that continue to experience um, I just want to add one uh, thing. In 1965, my dad was beaten by cops and put in an insane asylum for six and a half years. So that was kind of like uh, the awakening for me, you know, of that. Um, I was a teenager having fun, dancing and, um, you know, jump rope. And but this uh, experience drove home the, um, I think the, and, and as I, you know, matured a little, drove home the responsibility of me as an individual to make sure that this would never in my you know, uh, realm happen to anybody else. And I think that's what kind of drove me as I was teaching that um, I knew what could happen. I felt what could happen you know, if such a thing you know, occurred and it was still occurring actually in the broader environment. But what I could do in the classroom you know, would actually um, you know, make a difference, that I, I had a, a different kind of experience or a sight. And I had determined that, um, you know, my whole experience, I was the only uh, African-American girl in a class of 400 uh, white kids, rich, most of them. And uh, so I knew a lot, not necessarily had I uh, processed it all, but I kind of uh, could, I knew it through uh, just feeling it. So when I started teaching, I, I knew, I felt deeply that I cannot, uh, uh, any, not one of these children can be sacrificed in such a way that they will be uh, debilitated for the rest of their life because I was carrying such a, that was my burden that I was carrying and could uh, use it as uh, fuel to uh, help other young African-American children go forward. Um, so my, my, my burden is inner, and, 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 and at times it's not a burden really, it's a knowing, and it has caused me to take action. So my, um, I guess my own life experience is my balance, I, it, whether I'm in the classroom or not, you know, that, that balance of just having lived and, you know, how to share, live, share, live, share, and just keep growing. Real quickly, I would just say that I share what my life experiences are in terms of how, if it's educationally appropriate. And when something's happening in the streets and something's happening on the news, I, you know, I would give the ch children a chance to talk about it. But when I was when I was teaching, 
The work-life balance was very skewed. I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> but I still felt like I, in order to be alive in this world, you have to be a, a person who shares, you know, what's going on in that larger world. Maybe not as opinionated in a school environment. I can be very opinionated in freedom schools. <laughs> And then in this program, in this program, I could be, I could say my preferences and things like that, because I know that um, that we're all looking for the same thing. I I I'm still working on. I feel like I'm constantly working on work life balance. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm a good educator and then a horrible mom or a horrible spouse. Um, so it's always, you know, just trying to a constant rebalancing of the scales. Um, but I have come to understand, and especially even more so during the pandemic, the value of self-care and the value of um, taking time for yourself and that um, there is no shame in stepping away for a little while to get yourself together so that you could be a better use. Um, and, you know, if there, there, there are lots of things about ourselves that are in constant state of healing and we can't give to the children what we don't have. That's very powerful. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and as we're wrapping up here, and I just want to respond quickly to, to your question, um, Iman, is I, I haven't figured it out, and this pandemic has made it much more difficult as a full-time um, graduate student and full-time staff member and mom of three children under seven um, and a wife. I'm always kind of, it's always in conflict, right? It's like, what should I be reading? What should I be doing? Should I get this laundry done? Do I have a call right now? And with it all happening in the same place at home um, makes it even more challenging. And as I continue my own learning um, and seeing kind of the miseducation that's been very well documented, but not changing. And even thinking about from the, the video that we saw like 50 years later, why do we still need this? Um, and it's like, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so I'm, you know, you're hustling my son's first grade classroom with like so many opinions. No, we're not doing that optional assignment. Why are we giving this pointless homework? Um, just these critiques that come from a different space um, that really inform just how I see everything, what we watch on TV, like it's just everywhere and it's so explicit. And then sometimes I do need to, to shut it all off and just to step away. Um, and focus on the things that are inside of my control. And so that's one thing that I've been working on, um, but definitely have yet to master. And with that, we are over time. We have an amazing session ending us out today with Dr. Vanessa Siddle Walker um, and Samuel uh, Candler Dobbs. That's happening in the main space. So either on our Facebook page or on YouTube, you can catch that presentation. It's gonna uh, happen in about seven minutes. So you have some time to uh, refresh and refuel um, before joining that. But uh, I just want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists for being here um, and for being a part of this conversation, um, being a part of this work. Um, I appreciate you all and I thank you um, on behalf of the Center for Urban Education, the University of Pittsburgh. Um, if there are any questions we did not get to, um, I'll look through the chat and try to follow up individually. Um, but with that, we're going to finish up our session for today so that we can head over uh, to the last session um, of our conference. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.